half in the back. Unforeseen consequences occur. Well, now we're all caught up with all the big summer blockbuster movies that we didn't see in theaters. That's right, Jay. And I definitely don't feel like it was a waste of 10 hours of our lives. Was that sarcasm? I can't wait to watch the extended cut of Jurassic World Dominion. There's one thing I want. It's more of that. Anywho. We watched, we watched real movies. We watched the big ones. We watched three big summer blockbusters when the blockbuster is almost as extinct as dinosaurs themselves. <laughs> Uh, and it's interesting because the three blockbuster films we chose to discuss uh, go from, uh, well, it's the good, bad, and the ugly. Um, <laughs> go from great to okay to terrible. Almost uh, perfectly line up. Yeah. And our opinions might differ a little, Jay, but uh, that's where, where I'm starting this discussion out as. Okay. Are we starting with the good or the ugly? I guess we'll start with the ugly. I don't know if anyone even cares to hear about our opinions on Jurassic World Dominion, so we'll get that one out of the way. Okay. Right out of the gate, real fast. The Asylum presents Fantasy Dinosaur Force from Colin Never Smile Trevorrow, the director of The Book of Henry. He's back with another Jurassic World film. This time, Owen Thunderguns and his subjugated lady friend must find their daughter, Eleven, who they hide in a cabin in the woods because she's a human clone who was reproduced asexually in a lab by her mother who died of clone cancer. However, Owen and subjugated lady friend can't just sit still in that cabin and get real jobs. They've got to go on dino-saving adventures to show that they care about dinos. Oh, and dinosaurs are all over the planet, but people still go out living their lives, going to drive-in movie theaters and walking around in the park where dinos can eat them. Did I mention that? The fact that dinos are all over the planet brings out the best and the worst in people. However, old friends Dr. Ellie Sattler, Dr. Alan Grant, and Dr. Jeff Goldblum are on a separate mission to find out why Hank Scorpio and the Globex Corporation have created giant locusts that terrorize children. Would you like to hear the IMDb description real qu quick? Sure. Four years after the destruction of Isla Nublar, Biosyn operatives attempt to track down Maisie Lockwood while Dr. Ellie Sattler investigates a genetically engineered swarm of giant insects. Uh, not a once a mention of a, a dinosaur in the <laughs> IMDb description. Well, that's pretty appropriate. Because this isn't a movie about dinosaurs, it's a movie about locusts! Finally, at the end of the second movie in a, a franchise called Jurassic World, they established that the dinosaurs are loose now. That stupid clone girl, let them loose, because they're real, like her. I had to. They're alive. Like me. Oh, that's right, that's how that one ended. That was the line, it was the dumbest ending to one of the dumbest movies that's ever been made. Uh, and so I'm like, finally, now the next movie, we're finally going to get fucking dinosaurs rampaging cities and causing havoc all over the world. And we get like a, like a, like an Instagram, uh, news update at the very beginning. Right. It was like, yeah, there's some dinosaurs here. Anyway, locusts. There was one scene where a T-Rex rampaged through a, a, a drive-in movie theater. Which isn't in the theatrical cut. Really? We watched. No uh, shit. Yeah, you watched the extended cut on Peacock. Yeah, I watched yeah, yeah. the theatrical cut, which has even less dinosaurs. There have never been more dinosaurs than there are in Dominion in a movie. No kidding. That whole opening of the extended cut, where we see 65 million years ago, there's dinosaurs fighting. We see the mosquito yeah. land, and and then that goes into the uh, the, the drive-in movie theater scene. None of that's in the theatrical cut. You see dinosaurs in snow. You see dinosaurs in cities. How does it open? It, it opens with the uh, Instagram story or whatever it is. Now this, it opens with that. Oh, actually, no, I think there's very briefly, there's the bit where the, they're trying to lure the dinosaur out of the water and it bites onto the cage. I think it shows that and then it goes to the news story. But yeah, that whole opening, 
which is one of the very few moments of dinosaurs actually wreaking havoc somewhere in public. It's just gone. Wow, that's surprising. Look, you don't have time to put dinosaurs in your dinosaur movie. There have never been more dinosaurs than there are in Dominion in a movie. Like, mo maximum amount of dinosaurs in this movie. It was like two movies in one. Like, the, the Owen Thunder Guns and uh, uh, Bryce Dallas Howard stuff, and then, uh, and their pilot friend, Kayla. Mm -hmm. um, Han and, Solo? Uh, and, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Kayla watches Han Solo, yeah. We'll talk about that in one second. Okay. Uh, and, and Maisie Lockwood, the, the, the clone. Yeah. Um, the, the, is there some biblical elements in this film? I, I want to get really intellectual here. The, well, Colin Trevorrow, he's a smart man. He's smart. He, he writes very smart scripts. The, the, the virgin birth, uh, uh, she, she, is, she is like, like a, a messiah because she contains, the, she contains genes that could possibly save the world because she's, she's the new Jesus. <laughs> and, um, I think and that's then, the frustrating thing about Colin Trevorrow is he does have ideas. Like that first Jurassic World movie, there's a whole meta thing about the original Jurassic yeah. Park was great. And it's like, okay, you're trying for something, but the rest of everything that's happening is dumb as shit. There are some, like, possibly kernels of good ideas in this. Like, you know, who, who shows their true colors as being good, good human beings and bad human beings, which is like real life, yeah. right? There would be people trying to make money off it, and the Owen Thunder Guns runs into some in the beginning. Like, mm -hmm. he's saving a Diplodocus or whatever fucking thing, and... And he's like, how much does ground up dinosaur bones go for on the black market? $500,000, $1,000,000, $500 $500,000,000,000,000. Mm -hmm. And so as he lets him go, okay. I'm smiling because that's also not in the theatrical cut. Really? That whole sequence, you see him round up the dinosaur and then it cuts to him back on the, uh, back in the cabin. No shit. That's another part that's actually kind of interesting. Yeah. That idea of like, yeah, these dinosaur poachers. And right. Well, it's all gone. I mean, they come up later in the movie, I guess. I wonder but. why they cut it out because he, th there's like, o Owen has a couple of like park ranger guys with him, like two, I think. Yeah. And then the bad guy, like bad cowboy guys have like six or seven guys on horses and they all have shotguns. Mm -hmm. And the two, the two like wildlife guys are have like just simple pistols, and so like Owen has to like he's like I don't want to get in a shootout with these guys. We're gonna get fucking slaughtered. So he lets the dinosaur go. He lets them have the dinosaur, yeah. and it's kind of sad. They take the dinosaur and they 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 cart it off, and it just kind of goes along with them. And you know it's gonna get killed and stripped of all of its meat. And they're used gonna... in a cockfight, as we see later in the movie. Yes, Dinosaur uh, fights. underground cockfighting. <laughs> um... <laughs> Which is a part of the maybe 15, 20 minute stretch of the movie that I kind of enjoyed. <laughs> yeah, when they go to Malta. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it turns into a Mission Impossible movie. It turns with, into, a, yeah, yeah. Dinosaurs. Yeah. Then you got the Biosyn guy, the uh, uh, Steve Jobs, uh, uh, Bill Gates kind of, he's like the most apathetic, lame, boring villain ever. Well, did you even catch who that was? Dodson, Dodson, we've got Dodson here. It's a returning character. Wow. Remember Dodson from the beginning of the first Jurassic Park? He meets Wayne Knight and he gives Wayne Knight the Barbasol. Yeah. That's that character. They inexplicably decided to bring him back. He has such a tiny part in that first movie. He has nothing to do with anything other than giving him the Barbasol. But not that actor. Not that actor, which is like, if you can't get the actor, then why do it at all? Well, you know what happened with the actor. Oh, that's right. He's like a, he's, he's, uh, he's one of those, those uh, that I've heard so much about in Hollywood. There's no reason for that character to be that character from the first movie. Oh gosh! Now yeah. he's basically Tim Cook from Apple. Their whole facility—it's—it's it's like That's this round accurate. building that Tim looks Cook. just yeah. like the Apple uh, headquarters. If you ever watch any of their like, sure, well, they're making some kind of commentary on like big tech geneticists that either want to profit from pharmaceutical research or... CEO Lewis Dodgson has created a sanctuary in Italy's Dolomite Mountains where he hopes to study the dinosaurs' ancient immune systems for unique pharmaceutical properties. Their sophisticated scientific laboratory, uh, which I'm sure they use a lot of computers, uh, did have beakers filled with colored fluid. <laughs> For the little dinosaur, the baby of Blue, the raptor, to jump around and smash. 
Well, it's a science lab. You gotta have a beaker. You gotta have beakers. Blue, green, red fluids and beakers on tables, just open. Mm -hmm. No tops on them, just sitting there, <laughs> waiting to get smashed in an exciting sequence. The locust prehistoric DNA has made them stronger than they should be. They're multiplying like crazy, and they're not dying. What part of this don't you understand? Well, I do understand. This is going to be a global famine. Hey, hey, we can't anticipate everything. We need to eradicate the ones we released. What? All of them. Uh, his plan with the locusts was what? Again. It, what, <laughs> it, they, uh, him and Henry Wu had uh, uh, good intentions. But it, it, they like genetically engineered locusts to do something, but then it went bad. It got out of control, yeah. And then the locusts... Eventually he sees the error of his ways and burns the rest of the locusts that are still in the facility. Yes. Uh, I just watched this movie. But like, while also covering his tracks, because yeah, he's well, trying to destroy the hard drive. Yeah. This place, not your vibe. There's, there's our, our friend Kayla Watts, who's... And I don't know, again, Colin Trevorrow may be a secret genius because he was fired from Star Wars Part 9. Yeah. Because he made Book of Henry. And then everyone panicked because Book of Henry flopped. Mm -hmm. So they fired him from Star Wars 9. So then we have this Kayla Watts character who is essentially Han Solo. Mm -hmm. uh, she's a smuggler. She has her own little aircraft. And when you're in the cockpit, it looks identical to the Millennium Falcon. The framing of the shots. Yeah. The framing of the shots, the way that you could kind of see the secondary back seats, which probably aren't on a big plane like that. I don't know. What's that flashing? The losing it shield. Both trap yourselves in. I'm going to make a jump to light speed. Why is it blinking? Uh... That's the, uh, that's the aerial deterrent system. And then she's doing the, uh, when they're trying to land at the Apple headquarters, the Biosyn headquarters, she's trying to get landing permission. Yeah. And they're like, they're like, permission denied. You know, it's exactly like when Han Solo's <laughs> like trying to land at, um, on the Cloud City or, or fucking around with the, the microphone on the Death Star. Yeah. And it, it, she had that same kind of flair. So is that his like, like, hey, you may have fired me from Star Wars, but I put Han Solo in this movie. <laughs> I'll tell you, Colin, that Colin Trevorrow, he's good. He's a good director. Owen Thunderguns and subjugated lady friend, uh, who no longer has a will of her own, no. but to follow Owen Thunderguns around to the ends of the earth, because they're in love. And people called the, the first Jurassic World movie sexist. Right. She has, uh, Bryce Dallas Howard no longer has a character. Yeah. She's not the, the uh, sophisticated woman that she was in the first one where she ran the theme park. Now she uh, runs around and tries to save dinosaurs in cages with, with like scared college students <laughs> who don't want to do it anymore. They get rid of those characters real quick. They were the ones from the other one. They were annoying in the last movie, so like, eh. We'll put them in one scene to explain why they're not in the rest of the movie. Yeah. Why even bother? Just don't have a minute. Kayla, the pilot, spots the little girl in Malta being stolen by Frau Farbissena to, to be sent to Tim Cook at the Apple headquarters <laughs> because Henry Wu wants Kayla Lockwood to study her genes to fix how they fucked up the problem with the locusts and or save the human race by figuring out a solution to the world's food supply. This is, I'm, I got a lot from this by <laughs> barely paying attention. I was on my phone the whole time. Uh, half asleep, you know, I was playing checkers on my phone. <laughs> so then they're flying in her, her, her Millennium Falcon and, they're, and, and of course, pterodactyls appear. No one likes pterodactyls, but they always put them in these movies. Well, they can fly, so they're different than they other They fly dinosaurs. and they attack the plane, they fuck the plane up and um, uh, Owen Thundergun says, this plane's going to crash Bryce Dallas Howard. John, you better eject mm -hmm. because there's only one ejection seat that works or something. Something like that. And yeah. uh, uh, I'm, I'm, man, I'm man, I'm Owen Thunderguns, and you're lady. You're my <laughs> subjugated lady. Uh, and uh, you better get out of the plane. And so they shoot her out. And so Owen and Kayla crash land in, in a ice field. What is it called? A frozen lake? Yes. And they get out, 
And of course, now it's time for Dino set piece, Dino action set piece. Plug it in. And, and Kayla, it, I think at some point it's revealed she was former military. Where'd you learn to fly? Uh, Air Force. Legacy on my mama's side. Yeah, I'm Navy. And on Thunder Guns, I believe, is also former military ops. He has all sorts of skills because he was the 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 velociraptor wrangler yeah he trained the dinosaurs in the first so movie. he he has skills he, let's just say he has adventure skills he has survival skills mm -hmm. this, this is not in doubt right yes and kayla also does and they start walking on the ice the ice begins to crack under their feet what do they do they walk slower and more carefully <laughs> right yes and there was no dinosaurs around at this time, right? Right. There, there, so there was no threat quite yet. Yeah. Uh, what do you do in that situation, Jay? Common sense. Uh, I would run before it all cracks. Stop. No, no, no. Oh. That's a bad idea. Well, what's a good idea then? What you do in that situation is you lay down on your belly and you, you army crawl because- So there's less weight going straight weight, down? Weight, all your weight is, is distributed on the soles of your feet. All your weight is centered on one spot. Okay. Movie-wise, it's more exciting for them to, to slowly walk on the ice going. You're building the tension. Yeah. Tension, uh, uh, but logically, those two characters would know to lay on their bellies and go like this, <laughs> although it would look really silly. <laughs> and, and so that kind of stuff, even though this is a dumb movie, kind of takes me out a little bit sometimes. Okay. I was checked out by that point. I expect more from Jurassic World Dominion. I will say the shot where Bryce Dallas Howard gets ejected from the plane, that's a creative shot. That's just kind of locked on her. That's something. She lands in her thing in the woods, falls out, and there's a dinosaur walking around. And then she goes in the water. Mm -hmm. And then the dinosaur kind of looks around for her and then walks away and then she comes out of the water. Uh, I felt absolutely nothing. <laughs> I f there was no tension. There was no excitement. Yeah. There was literally nothing other than just like events happened in a Things sequence. Things happening on screen. They happened in a sequence. Well, the, the, I noticed three bits of ADR. There's, wow. a, there's a funny part, and I'll play it in this edit. Jeff Goldblum is lecturing students at the Apple University. Yeah. And that's his job there, I guess. Uh, just to teach, maybe, as an sure. instructor, a chaos instructor. He has a history with all this stuff, yeah. And he, he, he yells, unforeseen consequences occur. Unforeseen consequences occur. And it's like this wide shot. And he says it so strangely that <laughs> he I- He says every line strangely. <laughs> I know, but it's, it didn't even sound like him. And I thought oh. like it was ADR done by like a Jeff Goldblum sound alike. They couldn't get him back that day. And then like, like Colin Trevorrow wasn't around. <laughs> and then some guy was in the booth just going. <laughs> and he goes, and the actor just goes, unforeseen circumstances occur. <laughs> and, and they're like, sure. Unforeseen consequences occur. All right, we're done. <laughs> I just, ha I, I have these fantasies in my head of how things really went. And, and, and it was just, it just struck me. And then there's inserts. Kayla, when a dinosaur appears to attack them, she says, nope. Nope. And turns and runs. Okay. Uh, and it, it was very clearly inserted, mm. like, like, it in, it, like, we got to have something funny. Yeah. And then Owen Thundergun says, what an asshole. What an asshole. What an asshole. Uh, and referring to the dinosaur as it falls under the ice. I don't remember any of this. And it's this like is all in that ice scene? Yeah, his back is to the camera and he turns around and he's like, I think she's mid-turn when she says nope, but okay. you can see that her mouth isn't moving. Mm -hmm. 
So it has that uh, like Ghostbusters 2016 syndrome, where it's like we have to keep adding funny things yeah, everywhere. We, we need some quips because yeah. this this ice scene is is dull. <laughs> and then and then uh, they escape Dino. They get in some kind of elevator. The door closes, and then they're like. They're just like bored. <laughs> and then he's like, are you good? And then she goes, yeah, I'm good. And then I, I, th I think it was supposed to be read as like, we just went through this like harrowing nightmarish experience where we barely escaped with our lives. Yeah. Are you cool? Yeah, I'm cool. Like, like where they're both really terrified, but they're both trying to play it cool to each other. Right. But to me, it read as the characters are just <laughs> or the actors are just whatever. Well, that, that's how I felt through most of the movie, especially with the like legacy characters. Like Laura Dern looks like she doesn't know what the fuck is going on whenever there's any action happening, which makes the, uh, the, the big scene where they all finally meet. All of our legacy characters and our new Jurassic World characters, they finally meet. Yeah. They're all in the frame together, and I think it's supposed to be like a magical movie moment, moment but everybody's just bored. Yeah. Nobody cares. I've kind of fallen in love with Colin. I just, I just think, you know, his, his enthusiasm, his energy, his boundless optimism. He loves these films. He loves directing. He loves actors. You know, he's, he's just. And then, like, because they solved the locust problem, we cut to a montage at the end where we're back to our. Instagram, uh, TikTok news reporter re explaining the plot. Mm -hmm. And like, we have nature footage of animals just living in harmony with dinosaurs. We're just going to have to live with them. <laughs> and I'm like, again. <laughs> uh, Nothing's been accomplished in the movie. The locusts were stopped, but it's still, yeah. We still haven't learned anything. From a science perspective, and I know this isn't, this isn't real life, this movie, but you, you bring over one weird lizard from a foreign country to the U.S. and it just like cripples the entire ecosystem of an entire state. Mm -hmm. Because they multiply, they eat food supplies that belong to some other creature, which causes that creature to, to either starve out, which was the food of a different creature that ate this plant, and it causes like a domino effect. Uh, having dinosaurs everywhere, like living in harmony with nature is just like batshit unrealistic. <laughs> but they show like elephant herds walking alongside like uh, those other big dinosaurs, triceratops, they're like, like coexist, and then like seagulls are flying with pterodactyls and, and I'm just like, mm -mm. <laughs> So I'm like, I'm, I, I wouldn't mind any of the stupidity as long as it was fun. Yeah, it was movie, a slog. It's, the movie's a slog. It was like a I slog. said, that that whole sequence, uh, the Mission Impossible sequence, where they they find the underground uh, dinosaur fights and they have a chase through the streets, where the dinosaurs are chasing them. Like at least that's kind of taking advantage of the concept of the movie, and that's kind of it. And then the rest of it's just yeah, overstuffed with stub subplots and characters. We gotta put this in there, we gotta put that in there. It just feels yeah. like checking off boxes of things you're supposed to put in the movie. Out of, out of curiosity, I looked at like the three Jurassic World films and it's a, it's a, it's a textbook example of uh, diminishing returns, both in critical reception and box office yeah. worldwide. I, I would assume that, yeah, this one's, I think it still did pretty well though, right? Uh, th yes, I have a graphic here, and I don't quite remember the exact numbers, but I want to say the first one, uh, one, one point three or one point six billion. The first worldwide. one did really well. Yeah, and because uh, it was a fairly solid movie in well, terms of a reboot. It, it was like a crowd pleaser. Yeah. And it did well at the box office, but uh, a lot of people hate it. Well, sure. I didn't like it. Uh, you famously or infamously gave it a good review, and people were kind of baffled. You know, it was, like you said, it was meta, sort of self-aware, and it had the fun of a theme park falling apart, well, just on a grander scale than the first one. C compared to the sequels, it feels so much more like yeah. cohesive and quaint. Yeah. The second one, though, I've never stopped thinking about that second movie because it is so bizarrely stupid. Uh, that movie should be like a cult classic. The whole second half taking place in the spooky mansion with a... 
uh, illegal black market dinosaur auctions underneath yeah. it. <laughs> that's that's where they start to get into this this idea of what what would people do if dinosaurs were everywhere. Yeah. Accessible, not just in a theme park, and and they kind of fucked that up, making like a smart movie series about it, mm -hmm. which you're not going to expect in this day and age. But the second one, I think, scraped out just over a billion worldwide, and then this third one. Uh, in the 900 millions. Okay. So, I mean, obviously that's a lot of money, but there's the cost of the film and the promotion and all that kind of stuff. So, but another thing to factor in too is that first and second one were pre-pandemic. Yeah. And this one, I think was a pandemic delay, maybe. So. But still it was like, probably released at a time when people were like, eh, I don't know about going to the movie theaters. and. So well, that, and they're probably just tired of it. Like, oh, another Jurassic and, World and fatigue. Movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's and, and or it, it could have worked to the movie's favor, where uh, the people that did go to the theater who want to pay what they pay at movie theaters have an option between watching nothing or Jurassic World Dominion. Hey, we're gonna pay uh, uh, if we're gonna pay the prices that we pay at the movie theaters. Why not watch a two-hour and thirty-minute-long dinosaur movie? Like, there's the, a lot of stuff in the movie. There's a lot of stuff in the movie, <laughs> uh, uh, rather than watching a ninety-minute art house film. Like, mo maximum amount of dinosaurs in this movie that we're making. There have never been more dinosaurs. We ha truly have spared no expense. We have amazing action sequences. We have amazing dinosaur sequences. We have heart, humor, innovative technology, both as like um, a story point in the film, but also... And epic in... I'll tell you, Colin, that Colin Trevorrow, he's good. He's a good director. As a narrative around making this film, I and mean, we're pioneering brand new technologies to make this film. We have t more dinosaurs than you've ever seen in a Jurassic film. Uh, like mo maximum amount of dinosaurs in this movie. New dinosaurs, new characters. You know, you look up into the stars and you think that's 13 billion light years away. Like, what does? How is that possible? That it couldn't. You. you it, it was a slog. It was uninteresting. All I know is I never, ever want to see a character in a movie doing this anymore. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It made sense in the first movie, like, because Chris Pratt's training those dinosaurs, and that's, like, part of his move for training. But now he just does it every time he sees any dinosaur anywhere. And, and other people can do it, too. And other people just do it. And it works, I guess. I'm going to try that move next time I'm attacked by a dinosaur. There you go. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Guns N' Roses present Thor Love and Thunder, AKA Thor 4 More Thor, starring Natalie Portman as Thor. In this newest Thor film. <laughs> well, you're right. <laughs> so, Jay, in this newest Thor film. Uh, well, they checked off a whole bunch of boxes. Speaking of the last movie, where it just feels like a checklist, uh, this movie feels like Taika Waititi was contractually obligated to make another Thor. We were all in it. We were all we in were it. We were all in it together. He didn't want to make another Thor, so he said, I'm just going to make it a bunch of goofy nonsense. And then Kevin Feige said, you have to have Lady Thor in it. So they're like, that's what we're going to do. You're going to do Mighty Thor, which is Jane Foster as Thor. And uh, Taika Waititi's like, but I just want to make a bunch of dumb nonsense. I just want to make a goofy movie. And they're like, well, you got to put that in it. You got to put uh, Gore the God Killer in it. He's like the most serious, intense bad guy ever. But you got to shove him into a movie that's just nothing but dumb jokes. Uh -huh. 
How does that work? Oh, not very well, apparently. Dang. I, I was really annoyed by this movie. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Uh, Normally, I like we've we've praised in the past uh, when a filmmaker kind of intentionally throws his own movie. Uh, Gremlins Two, of course, is the, uh, his own movie. the gold standard for this kind of thing. Sure. But we were pretty positive on Matrix Four. A lot of people didn't like that, but uh, those are movies that are doing something interesting with the idea of uh, kind of making fun of your own franchise. They kind of be they're about that. Yeah. And this movie just feels like Taika Waititi didn't want to make it. So we intentionally just made it a huge joke. So in this moment, you were there. Yeah. You get Natalie like this, she walks over and she goes. she goes. But then he still had to shove in those Marvel elements yeah. that are more serious. And it, so he didn't go all the way with it. And it's not really saying anything. It's just a bunch of goofy nonsense. What other Taika Watiki movies has he made? He did What We Do in the Shadows. No, 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 in the Marvel world, nothing? Uh, just the last Thor, Thor, Thor Ragnarok. Thor Ragnarok, yeah. okay. Which I think found a good balance of everything. Well, that's the thing, that's the big takeaway from this is balance. Um, because Thor is now a comedic character. We can collectively take credit for that because we worked as a team. We used our hearts and our minds to defeat the enemy with minimal loss or damage. Where he's a very serious uh, demigod, a Norse demigod of, I'm Thor, the god of thunder. Isn't funny when yeah. I do this. It led to, to fish out of water jokes in the first movie. Sure. I think we've mentioned this before, but as the franchise has gone along, they realize that Chris Hemsworth's actually pretty funny. Yes. So they make him more comedic. And in this one, they turn him into Homer Simpson, basically. He, he's uh, he's actually space cop in the first scene. <laughs> That's true. He, he shows shows up to help and he causes more damage than, than necessary. Yeah, which is a fun sequence. I, I didn't hate everything in this movie. It's that imaginary line that you have to ride where Thor is a joke when he needs to be, but then Thor is serious when the movie needs him to be serious. Mm -hmm. I.e., you throw in cancer in this movie and it does not gel. Not with, just throw it in, but tone. hard cut from over the top comedic scene to chemotherapy. Right. Boom. Oh my God, what did we just do? Yes, because that's the history of the Lady Thor character. Yeah, and that's so. what I say when it's like, well, we got to put this in here. I'm going to rush through it as much as possible. Yeah. Because anything with her having cancer just feels so brushed over when that should be a pretty heavy uh, dramatic stakes of your movie. I mean, there's a lot of things that are smartly done in this. Like it opens with him in the desert you know, and their their world is dead or dying, and him and his daughter are, you know, thirsty and they're dying. The, the last of their race. The right? last of their race, yeah. And then it opens like you're panning up on desert, and and then the very end of the movie, they're in this big field of water. So there's there's a little like full circle ness to that because he finds this this space god. Um, oh yeah, spoilers on everything. Nobody cares. Uh, it's been so long since all these movies came out. We don't give a fuck. <laughs> he wants to grant, he's so angry at the gods because, and that's funny too. It's like you have this emotional, heart-wrenching scene where his daughter dies. And then he finds this oasis where the gods live and the god is this horrible asshole. He's just mocking him, yeah. All the gods are assholes. And then so you, you're Which is like, good in concept. I think the execution, again, that tonal whiplash. Tonal whiplash. If it was just him in the desert, that'd be one thing. But we just saw his daughter die. Right. And so it's like then all of a sudden the god is super goofy and comedic. It's right. It's like, ugh. We just vanquished the holder of the necro sword before he could harm any other gods with that cursed blade. And so you're setting up your villain's backstory and motivation and, and almost some sympathy for him, but then he gets the sword and then he gets like corrupted and vengeful because the sword is the god killer sword and it can slay gods. And so not just his own god on his own planet, but he wants to go, go after all of them. And this becomes a problem for Thor because Thor is a god. It's a good setup for your villain. And that's why I always yeah. complain that a lot of these Marvel movies, the weakest aspect is the villain. Mm -hmm. Here, the villain's good. He's got good backstory. He's played by a very good actor who's taken his job super seriously. And he's just in the wrong movie. Right. It's so bizarre. He's in the wrong movie 
J Jane with cancer is in the wrong movie. Chris Hemsworth is in half of the wrong movie. Depending on the scene. I mean, he, he knows how to, like, he's perfect. He knows how to do the, do the comedy and then kind of like gently segueing it into, okay, Thor has to be serious now. Yeah. And he works, but it's just a lot of the other elements seemed kind of all over the place. Like, a lot of the humor I like, I really like the scene where they go to the God City and Russell Crowe is Zeus. That, well, that's where it's like, we're just goofing around. That's, and Russell yeah. Crowe is, I don't know what his accent is, but he's very funny. <laughs> I, he's trying to do a Greek accent. <laughs> I don't know if it works, but but it's, he's Australian, it's, but it's so, funny. <laughs> yeah, it's a little garbled and, and <laughs> muddy. But that adds to it, and that's again that attitude of like, eh, fuck it, I don't really care what we're doing. We're just goofing around here. Right, right. That, that's right. where they go full force into that. Um, yeah. So scenes like that are fine. The screaming goats. All right, everything funny. Just relax. The goats are gonna be fine. It's not. We just need to meet. <laughs> they really. I was thinking of the. Uh, uh, David Pumpkin sketch with Tom Hanks on SNL. How's it hanging? I'm David Pumpkins! It's like, why'd you go all in on David Pumpkins? Because, man, they seem to think those screaming goats are hilarious. <laughs> Any questions? It's funny at first, and then they just keep doing it. So then the general premise is Gore, the god killer, god slayer, with the sword, magic sword, that just exists. I'm sure it's in the comic <laughs> books. That's fine, it's, it's comic book stuff. It's like, hey, there's a new thing. Yeah. He wants to get to an entity who lives in the center of the universe called Eternity that can grant a wish. Mm -hmm. uh, and in order to get to the entity, he needs to open up a secret gate which the symbol on the gate is the Bifrost symbol. So he needs Thor's magic axe to open up the gate in this temple to lead him to eternity so that he could grant, uh, so that eternity could grant him the wish to eliminate all the gods in the universe. Uh, and of course Thor has to stop them, but in order to lure Thor and friends, he kidnaps a bunch of children from New Asgard uh, as Bates. Who, who apparently aren't aware that they're in a movie. And all those scenes where they're captured and they're in like their, their cage, those kids just are like smiling and bored. And they don't look like that they know that they're in a movie. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> are they doing the lightsaber thing? <laughs> Looking at the camera. Oh, they, oh. oh. Yeah, and there's some fun stuff. Thor astrally projects himself there, and he, he says all the wrong things in front of the kids. He doesn't quite know how to talk to them. Yeah. I can't believe you killed Zeus. Well, you know what they say, never meet your heroes. <laughs> uh, is this a there's a fun bit where he's trying to talk to him, and uh, what's her face, Tessa Thompson, is like tickling his nose. So yeah. the whole time he's doing this, yeah, yeah, it's, like, yeah. it's kind of funny. I mean, obviously Taiko Watiki, Watiti. Watiti. Yeah. Taiko Watiti. Sorry. Hey everyone, I'm Taiko Watiti. I don't know how to say his name. I never said it before. Uh, knows how to bring the funny. Uh, even though you don't like him personally. I, well, there, I guess there was a, like a mini controversy around this movie when it was coming out in theaters and he was doing the promotional rounds and he, where he just really came across, and this comes across in the movie, where he just didn't take anything seriously. And I know he's a comedic person, but it just felt like he was uh, did like a, it was like Vogue or Vanity Fair or something, where he's doing like a breakdown of a scene from the movie. It's him and Tessa Thompson. Hey everyone, I'm Taika Waititi. And I'm Tessa Thompson. And we're here to, from Thor: Love and Thunder. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and he's just like, ah, oh, the special effects of the scene aren't very good, and just like you know, if you're self-deprecating is one thing, but this was right around the time when all the articles and stories were coming out about. How the, the effects artists for these movies are horribly overworked and can't, uh, deadlines are constantly being crushed and all these things. Does that look real? In that particular shot, no, actually. <laughs> it did. It's like, uh, maybe leave that alone, like make fun of your direction. And he just came across like he didn't give a shit about the movie, like, eh, like, like too cool for it almost. Oh. And I found that very off putting, as opposed to someone like a James Gunn. 
who is, his movies are comedic. They also have a tough time balancing tones. I think he does it much better. And then Taika Waititi just feels like, oh, I did that Thor Ragnarok movie. I had a concept for that, so we made that movie. And now I guess I gotta make another one. Uh, it's because it used to be when he would wake up, that was my reaction. <laughs> but you just left it there randomly. <laughs> it used to, that I never noticed it. I was I, never looking at you. Trust me, I did. You called it a dick and it was like, and like ah, how, how big do you want the dick? <laughs> <laughs> and then what happens is you take that footage, you put it in a computer, and you have like little bits of like blue lightning stuff. And then and then it, I didn't really like when Thor just said, I can give all my Thor powers to children. <laughs> I, I can just hand out my Thor powers to anyone temporarily. That, that's news to me that that's a, a power that he has. Would have been helpful during that battle against Thanos. <laughs> just zap out all those Thor powers to everybody. It seemed a little like... Uh, well, we can't have just Thor beating the bad guy. Right. It would have been, to me, more exciting if the kids were all in danger and hiding and barely escaping and hiding under this and that, and Thor was, like, fighting furiously to protect them at every cost, you mm -hmm. know? Um, but instead, it seemed lazy. It yeah. seemed like a convenience, a plot convenience. Mm -hmm. Like, they just made it up. Oh, he just hands out his powers. And yeah. Here's where someone tells us that he can hand out his powers. It's in Thor issue number 382. I mean, that's fine if that's uh, a power, but... Movie-wise... You don't just pull it out of your ass at the end of the movie. Movie-wise, it felt like it was pulled out of, out of his ass, mm -hmm. out of the movie's ass. And like you said, I don't know if that's true, if that... You know, Marvel people said you gotta have this kind of this. I don't, I don't know if that's actually the case. That what it, that's what it felt like. Because he made that first Thor movie, he did a good job. Then he went off and made his Jojo Rabbit. It's one of those like one for them, one for me kind of situations. Like, oh fuck, now I gotta go back and make another Thor movie. All I know is the man created a little movie called What We Do in the Shadows. <laughs> and and uh, the TV show is probably the best thing I've seen in a very, very long time. Oh yeah, and when we find her, finally understand why the movie's called that, it's because he's got the little girl with him now. And we're like, yeah, but who's this little girl? Like, I know it's Gore's daughter, but that kind of just happened. Here, have my daughter as I die. Well, I, th I thought the ending was kind of sweet. We needed, we needed, I know obviously she dies at the very beginning of the movie, but we needed something more with that daughter. Just the idea of like, oh, I'm gonna take your daughter now. Well, it just felt so like rushed compared to everything else. Yeah, I mean, if if there was some kind of logic to it, it would be like a like a soul for a soul kind of situation. Like, I mean, I get it. Yeah, thematically, what they're doing. But yeah, well, Jane, story wise, Jane had to die in order to save the little girl, which which you know disarmed the enemy. Mm -hmm. The bad guy wouldn't wish for. Um, because I don't know, I don't know the, the, the rules of, of the Eternity character, but the bad guy chose love over hate and uh, decided not to kill all the gods if, if the thing would resurrect his daughter. Mm -hmm. But he had to die, and then Jane had to die, and then they, um, Thor was stuck with the little girl, which I thought was fun. He has got to raise a kid, and she's part god now, and... They're now Thor, Love, and Thunder. They're a team, and they run around and save planets. It's a whole new adventure, I, Jay. I can't wait for her Disney Plus series that I won't watch. <laughs> you're, you're, you're more of an old man than me. <laughs> That's not true. I have some spark of hope left in me. Like you said, issues with it, inconsistency with tone, uh, logic, uh, what are we doing, you know, and then did you watch the post credit stuff? Uh, oh, there's something with uh, uh, Russell Crowe at the very yeah, end. Yeah, uh, I was excited about that. Well, that just means he didn't die, which I guess is good, because it was a little fucked up that Thor just kills him. <laughs> so it's like, oh, okay, he didn't die. Thor kills Zeus. Yeah. Like, like well, I was like, that's a little unlikely. <laughs> and Zeus is like there with this hole in his chest. He's yeah. like, I'm fine, but... <laughs> Uh, I realize that us as gods, we've we've become a joke, and it's time to bring back our wrath and make them fear us again. And then he goes, he goes Hercules, and then they pan over, and uh, it's the guy from the fucking Ted Lasso show. Oh, really? You ever watch that show? No. It's a bunch of bunch of crap. <laughs> Everybody loves that it's show, Mike. Sucks so bad. <laughs> Hey,
Here we go. In three, two, one. Tom Cruise returns as the character of Top Gun. The first film came out 62 years ago and had a homoerotic volleyball scene. This new film is updated for a hip new audience by having a homoerotic football scene. Oh, and there's ladies now, so it's not quite as homoerotic, unfortunately. The movie also has a soundtrack filled with dad rock, and it's like the fifth highest grossing movie of all time. In the film, Tom Gunn has to teach a class of pilots how to fly their planes more betterer and bomb a lunchbox at the base of a mountain valley. It's a dangerous and complicated flight path with little chance of survival. Hey, don't drones exist now? I watched Top Gun Maverick, which I had zero interest in, and within 20 minutes, I was like, hey, this feels like a real movie. <laughs> and it was very exciting. <laughs> yeah, I, my, my reaction to it, like, I had no interest in it, because I saw, I think I saw the original Top Gun a long time ago. I've seen it once, and I remember thinking it was fine. Yeah, it's just not my thing. Yeah, like like eh, it's like race cars, race cars and airplanes. I don't care about. He, he is an adrenaline junkie, that man. Yes. Um, but and this is a movie that would not be made today if it wasn't for the star power, still existing star power of Tom Cruise. Yeah, and it's not just star power. It's like uh, well, influence or uh, in influence. Uh, obsession for perfection. It's very important to me that it be practical. And I said, I'm not going to make this film unless we can accomplish that. Uh, he's like the real deal when it comes to like insane, like I'm going to get this done. Practical. Hell or, hell or high water. Stunts. And, yeah. Yes. And that's the big, uh, the big thing, but it's not distracting. I think there was one, like one of the Mission Impossible movies where he's like hanging under a helicopter or a plane, he's climbing on something and yeah. they've got cameras under there where they're like, you could tell they're like filming through this thing and then and it looks like, it, it was impressive, but you could tell like that the way he, the way that it was shot was not cinematic. It looked more like documentary footage. Because, because that's the only way they could shoot yes, it or something? But, but this doesn't feel that way. No. And all those actors are really in jets flying around. And, uh, you know, I read a little bit about it. They had to go through training and they were always throwing up. And um, they, they were required, once the plane took off, the actor themselves were required to run the camera yeah, I saw that. Do their own makeup, <laughs> kind of think, because no one could communicate with them. And and and, and so, a, a pretty intense, like, unusual filming circumstances in order to make this. And then they filmed a bunch of stuff and they come back down to look at it and they're like, nope, <laughs> do it again. Like, oh, fuck. Yeah, I saw Miles Teller talking about one time they had to redo a whole scene because he just didn't record, hit record on the camera right, or right, something. Right, right. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, but that's the selling point of the movie is that these are all real things happening. We don't have a little cockpit set and a green screen. Yeah. And you know, the lighting makes it look completely unrealistic and unnatural. Like you make a movie like this because that's what the movie is. Yes, and, and as far as the story goes, all the things necessary to make a movie blockbuster, it was done with like the the pinpoint precision of a of a guided bomb, <laughs> a laser guided bomb, like everything, yeah. and and it's almost like it's certainly I don't know if you want to call this a soft reboot or a sequel that I mean it's came definitely one of those later. legacy sequels is what they say yeah, now yeah because it's like the beats are all there he's the, he's the instructor now there's the, the group of hotshot pilots he's got the love interest. Um, you get the shirtless uh, sports scene. All the famous scenes, the, the, you know. At the beginning of the movie, I thought I was watching the first movie. I thought I fucked up somehow, because we get all the shots of the plane and like the font of the, Same the credits yeah. and then the highway to the danger zone song. It's like, did I put on the first movie somehow? Yeah, there's two, two changes I learned in the opening titles thing. It's like, oh, the, so the Air Force has a secret blah, blah, blah pro program and, um, it, it said, uh, the, it says, not in, before it said the men of the uh, this fighter, and now it says men and women. Ah, uh, okay. And it says, in, in order to to ensure the best pilots in the world, it was spelled I-N-S-U-R-E, mm. and they changed it to E-N. Okay. They, they, they fucked up the first time. <laughs> Tower 
This is Dark Star. We are taxiing with Information Alpha. Dark Star, you're clear to taxi. Runway 21. He hit all these points, like all the points, right? Flies in a super modern plane. Mm -hmm. The most modernest of modern planes. I thought it was a, a SR-71 Blackbird when they showed it. And I was like, oh, cool. But I think that's been retired. It's like a spy plane. I don't know nothing about planes. So. It's, it's, it's what the X-Men fly around in. Oh. It looks like that. It's a big black plane, and it's meant for, like, dodging radar. So it was one of those, and, and he has to get to Mach 10. He's trying to see if he can, yeah, make yeah. it to Mach 10. And uh, Ed, Ed, and he uh, pushes it a little too far because he doesn't play by the rules. Because he's, he's Tom Cruise. Because he's Top Gun. Right. And um, <laughs> and that part when it first takes off. Yeah. And the uh, we have that wide shot on the ground and that the the roof of that building comes off. That wasn't supposed to happen. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's like, oh, that's great. Yeah. Like real things happens. This wasn't a CG plane. And they're like, we we can't do it again. It's just too expensive to do it again because they're <laughs> flying a real high-tech jet. Yeah. So you have high-tech jets that exist, um, but in the movie, they have to use um, slightly older planes, mm -hmm. probably because in the logic of the real world, they couldn't just give the production of this movie 10, like, super expensive, high-quality, top-of-the-line fighter jets to use for Tom Cruise to play with in his movie. Sure. They're like, we'll give you... A, five, ten jets to shoot with and the pilots that will pilot them, but they're not going to be like, going be a few years old. <laughs> sure. And that also adds into the storyline because they have to do this mission and the, the bad guys have more advanced jets. So that adds a little threat there. Do they ever establish where they go? No. I don't think they do, right? Because they know, can't get away with that. Wherever we put it, it's going to offend somebody. Well, they <laughs> they don't in the first one either. It's, okay. It's just like, like nondescript bad guy. Because it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter, and it, and it doesn't matter to the... Um, the pilots, yeah. they're, they're all about performing their mission with precision yeah. and getting out safely. So the, the global politics of it doesn't matter to them. For, from an, that's like the only, if I had to pick a really small thing, that would be the only thing. It would be like, well, if this crazy country, I'm, I'm going to assume it was North Korea. I'll explain in a minute. But, okay. Um, uh, if this crazy country does something with the nukes, they're gonna they plan to blah blah blah. But the the threat was that they had an underground nuclear reactor that was gonna go online, and they're gonna start enriching uranium. And once uranium's enriched, that's when it becomes like dangerous. When you blow it up, it causes all sorts of damage. So there is a threat. But if they established the, the importance of that threat, maybe it would have helped a little bit. But really, the story was about. The characters. It's about the personal stakes. The personal stakes and the characters coming home alive and, and Tom Cruise uh, learning, uh, trying to get Goose's son, played by Miles Teller, uh, to trust him again and forgive him for the death of his father. Yeah. So that's really the story um, and that's the important part. But uh, the bad guys have that like weird fake logo on their plane and you never see them. <laughs> they just have the helmets. You don't yeah. want to show some like Korean guy. You can't show anyone. Yeah, but I guess, a, yeah, I forgot that that was an element of the first movie too. So it's like, okay, well that carries over. It worked. I only saw the first Top Gun once. I've seen Hot Shots like 50 times. Call them Huddies. Hot Shots. The mother of all movies. <laughs> In this movie, they fly over water off of the aircraft carrier and they enter like snowy peaked mountains. Yeah. It's, uh, North Korea, the north of it is very rocky and snowy mountainous. So you probably, it's probably Kim Jong-un making nukes. Sure. The wink, wink. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the one country you can offend, North <laughs> Korea. You don't worry about their box office returns. That's you don't want to offend China. <laughs> uh, and there was controversy early on about his patch on his jacket. So it was like country neutral to not offend China, blah, blah, blah. Uh, they like digitally removed it? Uh, I think just changed it from the same patch that he had in the first movie. Oh, okay. I have to look this up and I'll put up a, like a story about it somewhere okay. so you can read it because I don't really care that much about it. But so yeah, that's fine. But um, the you know the movie bounces back and forth between regular film and IMAX. 
So you know the action and excitement's coming when your aspect ratio gets wider. It's the old Christopher Nolan trick, yeah. And it's great. That's This is one movie where I didn't give a shit about it when it came out. It's like, I don't care about another Top Gun. But uh, now I'm like, oh, I kind of wish I would have seen that in a the theater. theater. It would have looked great. Well, that's the thing. is like, story-wise, it's fine. It does enough of what you need to do to establish yeah. the, the uh, uh, what's it, Rooster, right? That's uh, yeah. Goose's son. And Tom Cruise, their kind of history. Uh, and it's fine. It does that well enough. But then you get to the third act, which is just all action. And it's legitimately exciting to watch well, which i can't say usually by the time you get to the third act of a lot of bigger movies now i'm just like when is it over right yeah and yeah jurassic world like how long it just keeps going right and here it's like it rejuvenates the movie yeah, yeah. and uh, you mentioned that it takes place in like a snowy landscape that's like a nice visual change of pace from where we've been the rest of the movie so that helps too yeah they're practicing in like california or yeah. nevada or something where they can fly around in canyons and practice the but, only thing that it probably didn't need is a love interest, but that's one of those, well, you gotta put that in there. No. You gotta put that in there. Yeah. We're not gonna bring back uh, Kelly McGillis from the first movie. I'm not saying anything personal about her, but I know the way Hollywood thinks. They're not casting yeah, her again. Yeah, I, I guess. They'll cast Jennifer Connelly, who was like 12 when the first movie came out. <laughs> She's about 10 years younger than Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise just celebrated his 60th birthday Jennifer Connelly's in her early 50s. So it's not like absurd age-wise, but I know what you mean. But you know why it's in there. You know why it's in there, and that's kind of disappointing because um, Kelly McGillis kind of looks like a grandma now. But, you know, Jennifer Connelly, of course, aged well. Um, and so it's like, well, we have to have a love interest, but we can't bring back Kelly McGillis. I think she was the instructor in the first movie. Right, uh, Kelly McGillis, yeah, something like that, and yeah. and so they had a little romance. So it would be weird if she came back to, because he's the instructor now. Yeah, logically it makes sense, but you know the reason why. Tom Cruise <laughs> looks like he's thirty, and you don't want him smooching on a grandma, and he doesn't want to do that. You can be my wingman anytime. Bullshit. You can be mine. Yeah. Oh. It had all those like beats. Cause I think, wasn't Tom Cruise and Val Kilmer kind of like adversaries? Yeah. Like Iceman. And then they'd learn to be friends at the end. And that's kind of like the uh, Hangman character in this mm -hmm. with Rooster. You know, it, it's all very self-aware that they're repeating the first movie, just doing it on a grander, more bigger visual scale, yeah. more modern technology. And, well, um, that's, it's a prime example of like, it's not always necessarily the story you're telling, it's how you tell it. Right. And if this was a bunch of people on green screens, like none of it would have worked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mentioned Val Kilmer comes back and obviously he's limited with what he can do now. And I think they handled that pretty well. Yeah. Um, they worked it into the story. Uh, and I like that there seems to be a history in between the first movie and this one, mm. as opposed to a lot of these movies where they bring back the characters from the original and it's like they've done nothing between movies. Uh, their whole life exists in that first movie and then they just stop. Jurassic World, so you can kind of say that about Han Solo. Sam Neill, Han Solo. But in this one, it's like, yeah, he has a history with Jennifer Connelly, with their kid, and that's all kind of established without going overboard on exposition. Right. But it's there. And with uh, Rooster, Miles Teller and his mother, played by Meg Ryan in the first one, who has died in between the two films, and she told Tom Cruise, don't let him get into fighter piloting. He's gonna get blowed up. <laughs> um, and so, like, he delays his, his admittance to the Naval Academy because that's what was the wishes of his mother was, but. Tom Cruise doesn't tell him that, so right. they had some drama. Why'd you pull my papers at the academy? Why did you stand in my way? Effective, even the corny, kind of predictable plot things all worked. Yeah. Just because it, it's just like, this is the movie we're making. We're making a big summer blockbuster movie about fighter jets, um, and we're doing it exactly precisely the way it needs to be done yeah. without overdoing elements, without being too stupid. Um, and we're, we're really gonna focus on high quality action sequences. Hands up, Phoenix. Oh. 
But yeah, the, the, they go on their their adventure at the end. They, they they train for it. I think that's that's what makes the ending effective. Is that you know the stakes, mm -hmm. uh, not just the nuclear bad guys getting nuclear power or, or uranium, but the difficulty of the mission. And it's all very explained very clearly how it's down to time and seconds, and they have to perform all these maneuvers. Mm -hmm. They, they're getting eight, 10 Gs flying up out of this canyon. It's like a perfectly designed like <laughs> mission that's super difficult. And you could, I'm sure some people hated this movie because they hate Tom Cruise. He's, he's an egomaniac and he wins in the end and he thinks he's so awesome. And, well. Hey, he's responsible for getting a movie, multiple movies at this point made that have like real action scenes in it that are exciting to watch because you know they're real. Yeah. Uh, all those Mission Impossible movies, uh, there's some great stuff in there. Especially coming after uh, watching Thor and, and Jurassic World, which just feels so phony. It feels like you're watching a, like a, I don't know, a, a fast food commercial or something. Yeah, like, yeah. That just goes on for two and a half hours. Right. But, uh, they, yeah, they, they do their mission. It's fucking exciting. And then we have a little twist where they gotta get in the old plane. Yes, <laughs> yes. He, he, and all the dads in the theater clapped. He's like, we're gonna, sh we're gonna get a super modern ass plane. I'm gonna shoot up into the atmosphere and fly, fly what, 10, 10, not 10 knots, 10. Uh, uh, 10 Gs. No, 10 G is like the weight, the gravity. It's uh, Mach 10. Oh yeah. Sorry, yeah, the sorry. speed. And uh, th that's gonna be awesome. Then I'm gonna fly around in, a, in an okay plane, but then at the end, I'm getting the old F-14 fighter pilot from the first movie. Mm -hmm. And, and so it puts him at a disadvantage. Uh, yes. He was at a low point. Yes, and they have to they have to dogfight uh, in, in the old plane and figure it out, and it's exciting and adventurous. And, uh, Miles Teller saves him at the end. And all sorts of goodness. Yeah. It's adventurous, it's exciting, it's expertly done. But they were saying like Tom Cruise, Tom Cruise saved the movie theaters. Well, that's, yeah, that's the crazy thing. This is like the fifth highest grossing movie of all time now. Is it that good? Not really. But I think the fact that it's done so well is just uh, shows how people are just starved for like real movies. Yeah. And it's a good example of like a theatrical experience that's worth it. Yeah. It's like I think back to like I don't know everyone went everybody went nuts for the Dark Knight because yeah. it's like holy shit there's so much real stuff in this movie and there's yeah. IMAX sequences and it's like yeah it feels like a reason to see a movie and the opposite of that is Jurassic World Dominion uh, yeah that's such a slog to sit through yeah. They really love talking about their real rubber dinosaurs they had in there. <laughs> they had a couple. Oh. <laughs> We're just like Tom Cruise. We got real things in our movie, too. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. So, uh, yeah, that's that. I, I don't have much else to say about that movie, but if it's still playing in theaters, I'd go watch it in a theater. Check it out. Even if you have to deal with people eating nachos on your own lap. Does that happen to you a lot at the yeah. theater? Yeah. Yeah. They oversold tickets, so this fat guy had to sit on my lap yeah. the whole time and eat his nachos, and they spilled all over my clothes. Mm. All the nacho cheese got in my hair and my eyes. He kept farting well, right on top of me. That's to be expected. Yeah. I, mean. and I couldn't see the screen. Oh, it was a miserable experience, yeah. but. Uh, but luckily it was for Jurassic World Dominion, so yeah. it kind of worked out in your favor. So Jay, what would you recommend? Top Gun Maverick. Yes, me. that's it. That's it. I, uh, with a with a, a pretty good recommendation for Thor: Love and Thunder. Uh, definitely not Jurassic World Dominion. Uh, Thor: Love and Thunder is fun. Chris Hemsworth is charming as Thor. Uh, there's some good gags in it. Uh, a little uneven, so it falls in the middle range. But it's a watchable movie. It's fun. You may not have liked it. I, I, didn't, it was... I didn't love it, but yeah. I thought it was uh, certainly watchable. 
But Top Gun Maverick uh, exceeds both of them. Yes, yes. With, uh, uh, exceeds both of them by a long shot. Well, Mike, we finally talked about some big summer movies instead of more indie hipster garbage. That's right, Jay. Some of the biggest, most successful, most popular films of 2022. Yeah, and I guess now we have nothing left to watch but uh, Miracle Valley, directed by Greg Sestero from The Room. It's a Tubi original? What's a Tubi? To be or not to be? That is the question. But before we watch Miracle Valley, directed by Greg Sestero of The Room, we've got to take our next dose of Glumbiza. Oh, thank God. Because I'm fiending. You know, no one's ever said that pain pills were addictive. <laughs> Why don't they tell people these things? Uh, how many refills are left? How many refills? No refills. Oh, shit. Well, I guess we gotta make them last. Uh, oh. Wait a minute. <clears throat> wait, wait a minute. It's kicking in. It's kicking in. I feel all my joints tightening up. Ah, uh, the sweet pain-free effects of Glumbiza. That'll make watching Miracle Valley, directed by Greg Sestero of The Room, that much more enjoyable. Hey, maybe it's a good film. I don't know. I haven't watched it yet. I mean, it's a Tubi original. They're not going to bankroll just anything. I think Tubi is who I get my life insurance policy through. All right, I'm about to hit play. I see it, I see it, I see it. What? What happened? Oh. Did you hit some button? Did you hit some kind of wrong button? No, no, the goddamn internet's down. Oh my god. How are we supposed to watch more movies on streaming? Oh no. We were just about to watch Miracle Valley, directed by Greg Sestero of The Room. I was looking forward to watching this film. Well, Jay, since we can't watch any movies on streaming, I think it's about time you watch Star Trek The Next Generation with me. Oh my god. Look, I happen to have the very first episode on VHS. It's called Encounter at Farpoint, and it's the most boringest thing ever. But you gotta start at the beginning. Well, if we're going to do that, we have to get the VCR fixed, because I think it's broken. Oh my god. Huh, for some strange reason, the name Lightning Fast VCR Repair has popped into my head. Never heard of it. You know, I even think they have a location that's pretty close to us. Never heard of it. I'll go give them a call. Never heard of it. For some reason, I have their phone number memorized in my head. I've never heard of it. Never heard of it. Don't know what you're talking about. Sounds like bullshit to me. Oh. How's it going? Calling to get a VCR repaired. Something very familiar about all this. 